pull for a minute. So we are live with Investor Live. Welcome, uh, Phil Pogge, Patrick Donahue. We are co-founders of Investor, and we are broadcasting live from the balcony of the uh, famous Minneapolis Grain Exchange, downtown Minneapolis, where the almost the uh, whole economic environment of this area was really born on this floor in a lot of ways. So a lot of big business is created on that floor. Yes. So we're here. And I have nothing to add. I have nothing to add. Good job, Charlie Munger. So welcome once again, Investor Live. We are talking about getting the in with investors today. And specifically, we have a new website we just launched, raisecapital.in, raisecapital.in. And in that website, you will find free resources about our insights on building reputation, utilizing tools like LinkedIn to get in front of investors, and also information on our course and uh, even free access for a limited time to our course on using LinkedIn to get access to investors. And uh, LinkedIn is just one platform, but the, uh, the whole key to our course is to teach people how to really leverage digital media to get better access to capital. And so today's seminar or discussion today is going to focus on utilizing technology and specifically LinkedIn will mention a lot, but it really has to do with the broader use of social networks to make that fundraising process easier and uh, hopefully a little more enjoyable than what it traditionally has been. Absolutely. It so is, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. Um, anything that you can stick in your quiver to uh, make it easier, make sure you do it. Exactly. So we are all about helping people on the fundraising journey and helping get all the tools that can be utilized to make that process of fundraising and anything around corporate finance uh, easier for our small business owners and entrepreneurial community. So with that, let's get rocking and rolling. Uh, please give us any questions on the hashtag invest here. Uh, give us a call out or uh, let us know if you have any questions along the way. Otherwise, Phil and I have got some content to that we thought we'd run through with you guys today. Great. So, you want to start? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the premises we have is that people and investors want to be found. That uh, if you use LinkedIn and, and some of the search capabilities, you'll be able to go find people who have an investor in their title um, or in their description. And that's kind of a, a first point in, in going out and, and finding these people that you're looking for. Um, you know, not everybody's equal. Um, you know, some people. Uh, it's true. Um, yes. In case your mother did not tell you that, um, or if she did and she was lying to you, uh, there, there's, there's differences in people. And uh, some people would rather be in a cave, and some would be a little, want to be a little more public. That's true. Um, the, uh, you know, but. You know, really, when you go to investors, not especially investors, not all investors are, are equal. Um, you know, we're sitting here in Minneapolis, which has a great history in ag tech, and it also has a great history in uh, med tech. Um, you know, the ag tech has been here, um, you know, for over 100 years. Uh, med tech has had a great run in the last 30 to 40 years, and as a result of the of that, you know, here in the Twin Cities, there's, you know, those are kind of um, industries where people have made money, they are comfortable with the space, they they know how to make evaluations around uh, making an investment decision, and so they they tend to, to do that both quickly, uh, but they also price the risk appropriately. Um, whereas that's a wonkish term. We'll, we'll get back to risk. It's a very important concept. Yeah. So we'll, let's get back to that in just a second. Um, but you know, you can by using LinkedIn and some of the other filters, um, you can go and see, you know, what is the background of this person? What uh, kind of companies have they have they gotten comfortable with? Um, so that you know, if you have an, you know, a, a company that um, makes solar panels. And you're looking for investors. Well, going to talk to med tech people, that's probably not the right people. That they don't have any experience in energy. They don't have um, 
the manufacturing experience with um, you know whatever um, solar technology you're using. It's it's just the wrong fit. So if you can use this to go and find the right people, I think you're you're better off. Yeah, without a without a question. And, you know, both sides of the table really want that. The the people who are looking to invest, you know, they've invested the time to put a pub profile on their website, uh, on LinkedIn, elsewhere. They have a robust profile on LinkedIn. Yeah, they're telling people, hey, this is my background and what I'm doing, and you know, just because they've invested in things doesn't mean it's a open invitation for anybody and everybody to approach them. It really needs to fit you know, who they are as an individual and what their background and expertise and, most importantly, interest is. And that's why the, the tools that are now available for us entrepreneurs today are extremely powerful, and there's really no excuse not to be utilizing things like LinkedIn to make that fundraising process uh, much more efficient. Right. You know, and something else with LinkedIn is it lets you build your own reputation as opposed to borrowing somebody's <laughs> reputation. Or, or somebody else uh, building your reputation on your behalf. Because that's really what's happening out there, people. If you don't have, if you don't have a profile on LinkedIn or you don't have uh, an online profile, broadly speaking, uh, other people are building your reputation and by default you're doing it because you're telling everyone you're technical at a minimum. And uh, so either you control your reputation or somebody else does. Yeah. Well, and, and it's it's really not hard to do. Go spend you know half an hour um, to have something very simple. Um, to you know you might you might spend a, a few hours um, building a robust profile um, over time. You don't have to sit down and do that all at once. That's a, a great thing is that you can um, you know edit it and and spend time with it over time. So you know maybe you want to start with uh, what, just what the companies you've worked for are and what you did at um, some of these different organizations. And then spend some time um, putting together an, an introduction or a cover of what inspires you and uh, what uh, um, you know what how how would someone describe you um, if they're describing you to somebody else rather than have them you know fuss around and, and and do that themselves and probably get it wrong. Yeah, I mean we're we're always updating our LinkedIn profiles, and I know there's a whole bunch of things that I would like to do to take mine to the next level. But the biggest breakthrough I had was uh, two years ago when I met Simon Sinek and the whole concept to start with why, the framework of uh, why, how, what, and starting with your passion. If you're not familiar with Simon Sinek, uh, I'm sure we actually have blog posts on our website about uh, his work, but uh, look it up on, on TED, TED.com. But uh, the point I wanted to make is when I saw that in the whole how to position yourself to start with the why and to start with the passion first, uh, I shifted all my social presence to really starting with why. You know, Simon Sinek would say, when he had this epiphany, he said, well, I had to figure out what was motivating me to get out of bed in the morning. Like, why was I going to get out of bed and go do anything that day? And that's where I think the rubber really meets the road, especially with entrepreneurs, is when you can articulate to people what motivates you every day, what motivates you to drive downtown Minneapolis or uh, take the subway into downtown New York City and uh, to go get something done. And a lot of times it's because you're trying to make something, you're trying to make something better. And when you're developing a new product or a service, when you're a startup or a small business owner, it's that passion that matters and that's the passion that people are investing in because really not much else matters at that point, especially if you're early stage and, and pre-revenue. Yeah. It's people are going to invest in that passion. So long-winded way to say LinkedIn profiles, very powerful way to, to articulate your passion in life. That's it. So that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a great, it's, it's almost a traveling resume. Um, so make sure it's as accurate as can be. Um, uh, a lot of people will be looking at it and um, including people who can identify things that were fudged. So uh, be honest um, that, uh, you know, don't make up institutions that you went to um, or, uh, um, you know, jobs that you didn't hold or... Yeah, we do. We have to bring a serious note to that because that would... We've seen a couple times where entrepreneurs have done it to be funny because when they first put on their LinkedIn profile it was, uh, you know, the, the school of 
getting shit done. And yeah, that's funny, but um, at some point uh, uh, you have to you have to be serious and, and be real about who you are, especially when you're now in the business of you know raising capital and going out there and building a bigger social profile for you and your business, so you can attract influencers and investors. But, so that's true. You know, let's go, let's go back to the idea of borrowing reputations and pricing risk. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when you know a few years ago, call it 10, 15 years ago, the reason that third-party finders and investment bankers and intermediaries were able to command such a premium when they were raising capital for a company right. is because they were lending their reputation. So the the um, the, the intermediary had the Rolodex, they knew who the investors were or the debt purchasers were, and by bringing them deals that they had already vetted, um, you know, the, the intermediary was bringing its reputation saying, this is somebody that you should look at, and that's really what was, what was helping get deals done. Today, because of LinkedIn, because of Twitter, because of other ways to go out and directly find investors, the value of an intermediary or third-party finder is substantially lower than it was uh, 10 years ago when so much of the, of the, the capital that they had, not, not so much the financial capital, but just the, um, the capital of their industry or the capital of their business was their, their network um, and their Rolodex. And that's, um, you know, that's, that's getting flattened and, and the value of that capital is substantially less than it uh, um, you know, than it is today, yeah. and and you know then so how when you when you are approaching investors, if you're not borrowing somebody else's reputation, you need to go build a reputation with them. If it's simply you showing up to to say, will you give me money? I have a great idea. Well, you know, no. that, yeah, the answer the answer is no. Um, <laughs> it, it should be, and uh, you know, really, you're no different than than being a beggar, and you know, we, our, our entrepreneurs are better than that. They have more to offer society than that. So let's let's get this process right so that real meaningful conversations can happen, that there can be an exchange of ideas between the entrepreneur and the investor, and we get some money moving into the into the entities that should be funded. Right. The, the, the irony with, with LinkedIn and the social networks is that they probably – are going to do more to disintermediate Wall Street than anything else in history. And we're not even in the first inning yet, but uh, the whole concept of you know, Wall Street was really built as this mechanism to make capital more efficient. You know, so you had this party over here, uh, a business owner that was in New York City, and you had this person over here that was in Florida that uh, had done well and has money to invest. Well, the whole function of Wall Street and our capital markets as we know them today is to put those two entities together. And Wall Street has made trillions of dollars charging anywhere from three to ten percent on on connecting uh, investors with investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that day's not going to come to end. I mean, they, they still play a very major role there, but the ability for now, especially private businesses and private business owners uh, and entrepreneurs to go out there and to you know, be here in New York City, it doesn't matter anymore. You don't need to bump into somebody at a pub. You can go out and find these other people that are known or knowledgeable about your industry, and you can go approach them and, and engage in direct dialogues, which, oh, by the way, that's when you get better pricing ability. That's when you have much friendlier terms, uh, and that's where you can have a much better experience with external investors because you now know who these people are and can kind of control that process a little more than what has been done in the past. Exactly. You know, really, our our funding um, schematic for most of the last hundred years has really been a hub and spoke system. Right. That um, New York was the hub, and the spokes would come in from other parts of the country, um, and some people seeking capital would go to New York, and the people with capital would would meet them there, and that's where a transaction would occur. And then, you know, with technology companies, then that second um, hub opened up um, in the San Francisco Silicon Bay area, 
Um, but you know, there's really what is happening now is because of this, we're going from a hub and spoke system to a web system, and it's it's a much broader, it's much more direct, and you know the the typical places that you would find people aren't they're not there, uh, so you need to go find them in in their native environment. And, so instead of you know the airlines operate on, on a hub and spoke system, so you know can think of the of the change that would take place from um, you know if you only have large airliners flying to to designated spots that have limited times to what does it look like if you have you know small aircraft that can go anywhere um, that holds a smaller number of people but they're they're going to the same to uh, same spot on a on a on their own schedule. Phil's, yeah. Phil's a pilot, in case you can't tell, because he's always dreaming of airplanes, which is good. Which is good. Which is good. As am I. Can't wait to go flying again. Um, so the whole concept is, you know, we are we use this phrase all the time, and I'll go to my grave saying this, but people invest in people, and real investors want to be found, and. Once in a while, we are challenged on that, and I love that. So, um, anybody, you bring it on. Let's let's have the conversation. But uh, we just got an email back from uh, a person today that was challenging the whole concept that real investors want to be found. And the reason why we use the uh, the phrase or the the uh, qualifier "real" is because if an investor doesn't want to be found, I question whether they're a real investor or not. Because a real investor has a fiduciary duty. If they're truly in the game of investing in companies to get a financial return for their personal portfolio and especially on behalf of others, they have a fiduciary duty to be in the know and to be engaged with entrepreneurs and business owners and understand the trends and what's going on in business. And there's no better way to do that than to be engaged with the founders themselves of new businesses that are out there making things happen and influencing the uh, current and emerging trends in their industry. And so um, I completely disagree with anybody that doesn't think real investors want to be found. And so for any of you business owners that are, are watching this video that have been led to believe that you need to have a, uh, an intermediary, a, a finder, or a broker, or even an attorney or accountant uh, shepherd your conversations, um, you really need to think differently about this because real investors want to have direct dialogues with founders and business owners. And we just had a meeting with um, a very successful serial entrepreneur, uh, chairman of uh, uh, major uh, entrepreneurial organizations in Denver and, and elsewhere. Um, but he, he got that, he, he knew that himself because you know, people want to be talking to other founders and business owners. They they don't want to be seeing something that had to be introduced to them. Absolutely. And uh, you know, so it, that's the power of LinkedIn once again. You don't need that. Yeah, exactly. And this isn't limited to um, to just small companies. That uh, earlier in May, uh, Patrick and I had the chance to talk to uh, an executive at a Fortune 500 company um, right. when we were in Omaha, and the uh, yes, it was. Charlie Munger and we're about <laughs> But it, yes, so so we were talking to an executive of, of one of the uh, the Berkshire portfolio companies, and well, so you did give that away. I did there, give that there away. Was, there was some irony in that, but um, so we, we were talking to the to an executive at a at a Berkshire portfolio company, and he explicitly stated that he didn't want to see deals that came from Wall Street. He wanted to talk directly to CEOs and business owners. <laughs> And you know, it didn't shock us at all that uh, with their capabilities, they don't need the that value or that reputation piece that an intermediary has. Um, and also, by the time you're selling a business to them, you know, it's 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 a big enough business, it's established, but it's no different. They they want to hear directly from that entrepreneur and business owner, um, or you know, our CEO, um, business owner. Yeah, and I absolutely loved it when we're we're standing at the uh, when we're standing at the pub having this conversation with them, and it, it, it was so refreshing to hear this because it's something we we really have known, but to hear it direct from the, the horse's mouth, and for some people this is kind of an interesting point, but for me it's like it's like a duh moment, you know. Here you're dealing with an organization that 
everybody in their industry knows who this is. Mm -hmm. I would. Why would you have to go hire a Wall Street investment banker to go have this conversation with one of the uh, most cash-rich entities in in your industry? Yeah, you need to go and have those conversations directly. And and here's the CEO of this particular organization that's saying, you know, that's what he's basically doing. He's fielding phone calls directly from his peers, other other CEOs of of uh, companies in his industry and having those conversations. Mm -hmm. And he ignores uh, the stuff that's coming out of the transom from Wall Street to Nelson. Yeah. So that's the other part of this is the, the irony is when you do rely upon an intermediary or a finder or an investment banker, um, the irony is that you actually may be excluding yourself in your deal from a whole bunch of investors and interested parties that don't want to talk to you because they feel you probably weren't savvy enough to do something that was probably pretty easy and that's to reach out to them directly and you had to over rely on an intermediary to get get this job done. Yeah. And we we've, we've got written proof of that from uh, from a tweet from Chris Saka that's as part of our course once again raisecapital.in raisecapital.in uh, you can uh, one of our lectures you can you can see that tweet from Chris Saka but I just start to get mad when I hear this story. I'm like getting mad at some. I don't know what I'm getting mad at, but it's like some of these things. I just I'm so. You know, it's, it's a beautiful summer day here. It is a beautiful Twin summer cities. day. You know, you don't know, don't get yourself all worked up. So let's let's uh, let's modify this a little bit. Yeah. And we'll we'll talk about a success story. Right. So you went to Singapore, and how did you use LinkedIn? So uh, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to work on a. Uh, putting a deal together where we merged two companies, put a new company together in Hong Kong, and we were seeking $100 million of investments. And so... No, $100 million, that's, that's okay, man. Here and there. Well, the irony is is we picked that number so we could get in front of some of the, the investors that could actually play at that level, like uh, the Sovereign Wealth Funds, So, which was really fun. But, uh, but I was able to go out and build these... Uh, open up dialogues and to start to build rapport and get to know people through LinkedIn. And, you know, LinkedIn is now to a point where it's it's uh, it's definitely global. It's a tool used by almost everyone in business these days. And it's really nice when I can reach out to somebody, you know, that's on the other side of the world and they could see my LinkedIn profile, who I am, what I'm doing, what I'm working on. That you're a real person? That I'm a real person. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, if you, I mean, think all the luck that Nigerian princes could get that they would, we should probably not even say that, but <laughs> they were to get LinkedIn profiles. But um, that made that process so much more efficient, and then you're able to get. You like that one? I did like that one. You know, there's a lot of actually, it's it's the Saudi princes I get reached out to from all the time on LinkedIn. Oh, I don't know why that is. They huh. want to be portfolio managers for. For uh, some Middle Eastern company, anyways. Well, well, well yeah. Um, but uh, but in all seriousness, so the ability to go and open up those conversations with with people elsewhere, and for them to easily see who I am as an individual, made all the difference in the world. And so, for a little bit of time and effort in you know making sure my LinkedIn profile was robust, if it was you know five years earlier. I don't know. We uh, we would have probably been paying twenty, fifty plus thousand dollars to people to help us reach out and establish relationships. Well, you I mean I, I can't even imagine what it would be like. You know, I mean, some of these tools have made it so much easier to actually know who you're talking to on the other side. Oh, absolutely. And I think I think your number would have been bigger than that because look at. Well, yeah. When somebody hears we're raising a hundred million dollars, the proposals we got were ridiculous. But. Yeah. So that there's there's your admission price that right. you were going to go borrow somebody else's reputation because you you didn't have enough of one established, or for a way for somebody to go validate your reputation when you're right. when you're going to talk with them. Right. So, you know, three percent to eight percent, whatever that number would be for, you know, a third party finder on a hundred million dollars. Well. You know, that's that's more than most of our entrepreneurs are looking for. Right. 
Well, yeah, and a lot of times you you get thrown into this world as private business owners. You get thrown into this world of it's one thing if a if a broker or somebody would charge a success fee, but a lot of times they're they're seeking. We had a proposal on the table that uh, they wouldn't even start working with us for until uh, we paid them two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. And it's, I, I'm, I'm still shocked at how much of that stuff we saw, which was unsolicited. I mean, just, you know, being out there and being in the, uh, this was in the uh, uh, metals and, and mining industry, but it was amazing how much of that stuff was out there. But once again, I mean, LinkedIn helps you cut through all that clutter. So in this situation, when we'd meet people and stuff like that, when I would go into conferences, I would vet, you know, if I had the list, a lot of times they did. I would vet everyone that would be at the conference. I knew the five or ten people I wanted to talk to. I cut out all the noise from the hundreds of other people, and I focused in on the people. And we met some of the most unbelievable investors and influencers in the metals and mining business when we went overseas because it was laser-focused. We knew who we wanted to talk to. We had done our homework. We utilize tools like LinkedIn and other things on the internet to be very targeted in our approach. Yep. And so that's again the whole basis of our course is yeah, we, we try to make it kind of fun to say, you know, find investors with LinkedIn. It's a little more stating the obvious, but it's really that comprehensive approach of vetting and understanding and building rapport. That that is such an important topic that you brought up that you, you and I are, are, are really good about not taking a meeting with someone unless we can look at their LinkedIn profile that we, we've been burned. I'd like, to, I'd like to say I'm better than you. Now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You just keep thinking that. No, I know. But, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going halfway around the world or if you're just going halfway across town. Unless you know who you're meeting with and what you want to get out of this meeting, be very, very judicious about your time. And by seeing the background of the person you're meeting with, that should help you decide if you should take this meeting or if you shouldn't. Right. And you know, we, we, we keep beating on this drum also that time is the most valuable resource of any entrepreneur. And you know, if you can use this to avoid wasting time, there's a huge amount of value in it. Right. I have to this is a little, a little bit of a tangent, but I have to tell this story. I think I told you a part of it, but I had a meeting with a Fortune Fortune 500 company. Uh, they asked me just to come in and be kind of a, uh, it was a group of other uh, professionals that had to opine on some uh, medical device and medical technology related stuff. And uh, went in there and we, talked, we were talking about social networks and so forth, and I was trying to make a point on how important these tools are, especially with health technology. And uh, and I went around the room, there was 12 people in there, and I said, this is your background, this is what you did, this is what you did. You don't have a LinkedIn profile, this is what you've done, this is what you've done. Um, you're missing parts of your LinkedIn profile, which make me ask a lot of questions, boom, boom, boom. And uh, the 10 or 12 people in there were just about shocked. And the guy that did have a LinkedIn profile was the most senior person. And he asked me some more questions, and I said, um, I will never take a meeting and I never go to a meeting until I've done, you know, full due diligence and I've looked at people's backgrounds and understand who they are. Because otherwise it's a waste of my time and your time. And and so that's really powerful. We've got a good friend of ours, a client that uh, has been successful in raising money and he had done his due diligence on what ended up being his lead investor. and. I believe a good reason why he became the lead investor is because he was so impressed with the the time and effort Mark had taken to do due diligence on on the investor. Absolutely. So to, to the extent that when the investor walked in, um, he had um, the, the entrepreneur had already spoken to the CEOs of other companies that he had made, and he didn't really broadly publicize that he had made these investments, and he went and tracked these people down, and. Um, We're giving away our best secrets, right? And and, uh, and you know, and when he could, when he could look the, seat, the the investor in the eye and say, you know, everybody who you've invested in so far speaks highly of you. I think we're gonna have a great conversation. That uh, that was really really impressive and powerful uh, for this investor. Yeah, and the entrepreneur knew more about the investor than the investor did about the entrepreneur who had just spent a bunch of money flying in the visit. And so that was uh, that was a good move.
um, once again, utilizing LinkedIn and the advanced search functionality, the ability to see who other people know and what groups are part of and part of the, their passions and stuff like that is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. And we all think we know what LinkedIn is in and why it's a cool tool and, and how to utilize it, but there are so many tricks and tactics and secrets on, on being able to utilize it in such a way that you can make it one of your most powerful tools when it comes to uh, fundraising. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about sending emails because there's there is a way to go from just you know doing research to actually going and initiating a conversation and beginning that process of building a reputation. Sure. Is there a question in that or should we just talk in general? Yeah, let's just start blabbering away. Blabber we usually like, do. I like to just blabber away. Blabber away about emails. So I, I decided that's gonna be our promotional agency, Blabber and Yammer. <laughs> so in mails has been a, a is is a really great feature, and it really gets unlocked when you pay LinkedIn a few bucks a month. Which, by the way, we both do. It's it's well worth it. But when you can have the ability to have someone you're not directly connected with, and to be able to um, send them a message which has a high high likelihood of being read, doesn't mean it will necessarily get returned. There might not be a fit, and what have you, but you can almost guarantee it'll be read. Um, it's uh, it's extremely extremely powerful and well worth the money. But a trick to utilizing it appropriately is to have done your research on the other party and to call out points of com com of, of interest, uh, common interest. So if you both have uh, donated blood to the American Red Cross um, and you build homes for Habitat for Humanity. Dropping a few of those things in there and, and establishing those points of common interest and building some rapport. You mean establish an emotional tie? Yeah, yeah. This whole concept that uh, you need human beings to uh, have an emotional tie. That's what it's all about. So, what do you think about, you know, when you open up dialogues with people, what's worked and what's not? You know, I, um, I think that if you can, I, First, first of all, I would say you want it to be succinct in what you're um, in what you're trying to share with this person. That, right. Um, you know, it, it's it's a bit like an email that the longer it is, the less likely it is to be read. Right. That I think if you can keep this to you know a few bullets, um, you're better off. Um, it's kind of uh, I forget who said it. Uh, we were talking with someone the other day who's a writer that um, that. Uh, he spent uh, um, five hours uh, um, writing a big long narrative, threw it all away, and in, um, and in the next 20 minutes summarized it into into uh, eight sentences. And it's kind of one of those things that if I had if I had, if I had enough time, I'd write it better. And yeah, sure. yeah. Who was that? Emerson uh, or somebody? So said that you had that quote. It was uh, you know so it, be succinct, be direct. Um, that uh, not direct in terms of. You know, we're looking for money. We give us money. That's baking. Um, but direct in terms of, I see you have experience in this space, and I'm also doing um, interesting things. Um, would love to open a conversation with you about what I'm seeing and uh, and what you're seeing. And you know, that's that's a pretty innocuous um, ask, and especially when you're putting it on um, the time schedule that works for the for the other person. Right. Um, and especially when you're talking, the way I love to do it, my little secret sauce is you know, to have industry conversations. This is what's allowed me to open up some very nice dialogues with uh, with angel investors and other influencers, where they've been very generous with their time because there was no specific ask other than to have a dialogue about industry trends. You know, what are you seeing? What am I seeing? What's happening? And once again, to the point of real investors, I mean, real investors, real influencers, people that are having a meaningful role to play in an industry and a business, they want to be having these conversations. They need to be having these conversations. And so when you have that emotional hook and you're having a dialogue around what's going on, 
uh, in your industry and so forth, that's what opens up doors. Then down the road, as you build rapport, now you've got permission to have more of a conversation around fundraising or if you're looking for acquisitions or, or something maybe where you're you're calling more of a favor. Yeah. So um, tell me about tell your experience with, with LinkedIn. I know when we first kind of uh, started working on projects together and so forth, you were what well, we all were at some point. Uh, uh, where you know LinkedIn was kind of like ah oh, this is kind of interesting and and so forth. So where was your tipping point of like where LinkedIn was interesting to you know LinkedIn is a critical tool to be successful in business. You know um, LinkedIn with me became very important um, once once I started to sell that okay. uh, once I, once I had services that I was trying to sell. That it was you know, being able to go and present myself um, as you know being experienced and a thought leader um, was important, right? Um, and and that's that's really that, that tipping point that you know when I was um, you know, doing you know, doing corporate finance work for the last company I worked for, what you you know I had an account but it wasn't a particular value. Um, you know, it was nice to know who was on the other end of the phone if I was uh, um, talking with somebody. But you know, it, it uh, you know, building that wasn't a big priority. But in the last few years, you know, once I've um, you know gotten closer to you know having having money move, um, that that's uh, that's really when it's been substantially more valuable. Okay. I, my personal tipping point was, uh, I think, in late 2008, early 2009, when I kept getting all these invites and would, you know, accept them. And you know, probably like we all start with LinkedIn, kind of update a few things here. And then I started to get, you know, a couple from like CEOs or people that I really wanted to make sure had favorable impressions of who I was. So then I had to take LinkedIn to the next level. And then I had this aha moment where it was like. I spend all this time and I get all this help. Like, you know, at the time I probably had you know fifteen hundred, a couple thousand contacts in, in Outlook, and you know, trying to keep up to date and what are people doing and staying in touch and so on and so forth. And it hit me it was like, oh my gosh, here's this. I could design a more perfect tool for this job of being able to stay in touch with people and know where they're going and not having to worry about their the latest and greatest email address and so on and so forth and so that's where I was like I've got to put my time and energy into LinkedIn and that's what's worked well for me is whenever I meet someone making sure I'm LinkedIn and now I'm to the point where I don't even worry as much as if they get into my my contacts mm -hmm. and stuff like that because I know once we're LinkedIn or if they've got a good LinkedIn profile I know how I can uh, get back in front of them when and if I ever need to do that. Yeah. So. Exactly. You know, and and uh, you know, before you and I put our flags together, I had a CFO for higher business, and you know, so I had a I had a website that I used for marketing, and you know that the value of that is nothing compared to the value that it, it's on uh, my LinkedIn profile. That everything that's on my website, I was able to put into my LinkedIn profile, and LinkedIn is so much more searchable. Um, and, and it's so e so much easier to find me um, than it was, you know, as a single shingle with a um, with just a website. Right. So yeah, and so check out raise capital raise capital dot in raise capital dot in. This is our website that we are dedicating to promoting our course on utilizing LinkedIn to find influencers and investors. And take a moment to check out our content there, and please sign up for our course. We've uh, made it free for a limited time. You just have to plug in your email address and, uh, and confirm it, and uh, it'll shoot you back a link that will give you free access to our course on utilizing LinkedIn to find investors. But a lot of the things we talked about today are tips and tricks and things you can utilize, whether it's finding investors or customers or whatever your business objective is. There's really nothing in there that everyone can't use. 
uh, a couple double negatives in what I just said, but there's sure. something in there for everyone is another way to say that. You know, and, and also in there is, is there's more practical tactics. Right. Um, so it's it's less of us talking about platitudes or our personal examples and more um, tips and tricks on how to use it effectively. Yeah, and another great thing about the course, too, is that it keeps it high level for the purposes of achieving corporate finance events like fundraising and so forth. We're not getting into, you know, how to uh, make the perfect uh, LinkedIn profile. There's a whole bunch of stuff out on the internet that that's available for you. We give some quick pointers on what's really important, but um, other than that, we're not going to dive into the details. And the course is broken up into two to seven minute chunks where you can dive right in and. If you just want to know about the advanced search functionality and how to utilize that uh, to the best of your ability or or why you should upgrade or not upgrade to LinkedIn Premium, those are all things you can parachute into. Yeah. So racecapital.in. And uh, with that, I haven't been paying attention. Do we have any, uh, do we have any questions that have come over the transom from the from the ether? we got a bunch of messages here. See if I can. Yeah. We have Jason with us today off camera. Yeah. Jason's over there, lounging. Hello. Okay. Uh, Samuel wants to know, uh, is there ever a wrong time to reach out to a potential investor? Oh, good question. Okay. Ah, so I get the re gist of it. Re repeat the question. So, there's a, so Samuel brought in a question that had to do with, is there a wrong time or or a time that's not good to engage in conversations with investors and I'll take a next step or even influencers because our answer is the same. And the the answer is is it's always a great time to engage in dialogue with investors and influencers. Now this is this is um, may fly in the face of con, uh, conventional or traditional wisdom. Uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, I would advise companies to wait until having any conversations until you've got all your ducks in a row. And we've done a 180 on that completely. You can never start early enough, soon enough to just open up dialogues. And that's why when you do that, when you're utilizing your reputation and opening up conversations about the industry, you don't have to get into a situation where you're pitching your business or pitching your idea. You're just opening up a conversation. What do you want to? Yeah, I think uh, you know. There's being reasonable, be practical, be a decent human being. Um, you know that uh, picking up the phone and calling somebody in the middle of the night is not the right thing to do. But to uh, send them an email so that they open it on their schedule is uh, yeah, that's that's fine. It's great. Um, you know, and and I and I agree with your sentiment about. Um, not needing to have everything in order, that I, I think it's okay to say we are getting things in order and we just want to have some conversations with influencers because it, it, it actually kind of takes the pressure off of, off of someone that you're not asking for a check because you're not in a position quite yet to be ready to take a check. So if you say, you know, we're, we're getting our house in order and we're going to be looking for investors, in the meantime, we just want to go have some conversations with people. You know, that's. You know, you've really that's all fair game. Yeah, you've you've taken pressure off of off of anybody from you know having them judge every question you ask as if the the next one is going to be are you going to give me money? Uh, Sam has a follow up to that. So he says, "Okay, but well, what if the investor asks you for any fundraising?" So the, the he's obviously uh, a yeah, right. he's like hey. making money, but right. he's also trying to have general. So so. This this is a really interesting thing. You might want to repeat the question. Oh, so so the the follow-up the follow question is, um, what happens if an investor asks you if you're fundraising? Yeah. Well, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, yes, you are. Um, but you can also I would also say yes, we are fundraising, but more importantly, at this point, we're trying to have conversations with influencers and investors. Um, and really to get a sense of, of what are people thinking about um, this space. So that, uh, you know, I, I, I would not try and, and hide that um, if you are fundraising. Um, that, you know, now, now it's out in the open. And the great part is 
you are not soliciting an investor now. Um, that you that the way that securities laws um, they they have approached you about that topic. Um, you just wanted to have a conversation with an industry influencer, and now they've opened up the topic of investment. Um, so it, it you know, that, that changes the the dynamic of um, how this works. You you can talk a bit more about the securities component. Yeah, but I don't want to. Okay, <laughs> go over faith and return it. <laughs> no, uh, well, the one thing I would the one thing I would add is the rule of thumb. If somebody asks, is, "Are you fundraising?" Uh, just tell them the truth. You know, for for a lot of entrepreneurs, it may be something to the lines of, um, "We know we're going to need money, uh, but we don't know how much yet. This is where we're at in our process, and we'd like to start the fundraising process in a couple months or what have you." Or maybe you are in the middle of, a, of a raising capital and just be honest about that and where you're at in the process and get their feedback mm -hmm. and just let them know, you know, your, your point of contacting them was not to ask them to look at um, your company for an investment, but was just to open up a dialogue and to share industry insights and, and thoughts. And once again, that changes the dynamics quite a bit because the other aspect of this to keep in mind when you're fundraising, uh, it's very easy for entrepreneurs, especially when you're cash strapped and you want to you know, get money in and meet some milestones, to just chase any money that's green. And that's been the death blow to way too many companies. You need to be in a situation where you're picking your investors. Uh, you need to be doing as much due diligence on the investor as they're going to do on you and uh, your business because um, if you're an early stage company, uh, you're really bringing on business partners, um, and you got to keep that in mind. Your first 20, 40 investors are going to be your business partners, whether you like it or not. So make sure they're good people and people that you would uh, enjoy going to dinner with. Because if it's not, you better think real hard whether you take that investment. Absolutely, it's it's so hard to get someone out of your company. Once you get them in, right, and just be really, really sensitive to that. that you know, uh, that there's there's the old line about the first five clients make a business. You know, you can almost say this is the first the first five investors make a business in the same way, or can destroy a business. Right. Excellent. Well, I know we got some other outstanding questions, but we've gone over our time. So hit us up, and a great way. We do uh, office hours on all of our courses, and um, our emails are out there. Uh, we have a community dedicated to our students, so uh, please join that community, reach out to us, and we're happy to help wherever we can, and um, our students mean the world to us, so thank you for spreading the word and, and let people know about raisecapital.in uh, so other people can get access to our course for um, we're pretty cheap right now, so uh, we can get that feedback and, and make it uh, the best course possible. That's right. Keep fighting the good fight. Thanks for uh, doing what you can to make our world a better place. Excellent. Yes, indeed. Thank you. On behalf of the entire investor team, thanks for joining us today.